when I was making the decision to go to Hampton, I remember watching a few years ago, my graduation video. And when it was asked, so what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I think I'm going to be a computer scientist. And I watched that and to think about that now, like, so I knew then that was a part of my destiny, but that is not how my life Welcome ended up. To Beyond the Ball Podcast. <laughs> What's going on? What's going on? What's going on, ballers? And welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones. And as you all know, I'm, I'm excited uh, for our guest today. I'm always excited because we, we get some phenomenal guests, right? Just some people just doing some amazing things. But if this is your first time listening to Beyond the Ball, I want to let you all know the focus of this podcast is to focus on stories, strategies, and successes to help student athletes succeed beyond their degree. If you're on YouTube, listening, watching, subscribe, hit like, do all that good stuff, because uh, this episode, you're definitely going to want to want to share with a friend. So now, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring out today's guest. And uh, today's guest. Wow. Just I mean, I've I've had the opportunity to connect with her on Clubhouse and just seeing just the amazing thing that that she's doing around technology. So I'm going to bring her out. I'm going to let her introduce herself. But she goes by the black techie, none other than Chris Smith. Chris, how are we doing? I am amazing, Jonathan. Thank you so much for being here today. Definitely, definitely. So, Chris, I'm, I'm going to kick you to mic, and I'm, I'm going to let you just, just introduce yourself and tell a little bit uh, about what you do. Just give the people a, a snapshot of just the work that you do. Okay, so, um, of course, as was introduced, my name is Chris Smith. I'm known online as the black techie. I kind of would say I am where tech, data, and sports, and culture kind of meets. Um, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis in my agency is I work with professional athletes to help them build a direct relationship and have increased in fan engagement with their fan base. But we're using the power of text message marketing and data to do so. Um, fun facts about me. Um, I've been in the technology space for 11 years. I'm originally born and raised from Baltimore, Maryland. If you can't tell by my thick accent, um, I've been in Atlanta, Georgia the last almost 11 years. But um, sports and technology has been a true thread to the story of my life. I've been in sports and technology as long as I can remember it. I know we'll get more into that today, but that's what I do for my clients. I really help them look at the ways that they are really engaging with their fans and text message marketing is a great way to do so. It seems to be the new black right now, um, but a lot of athletes are really not leveraging it and using it. So I show my clients where those opportunities are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so the black techie, where, where did this come from? When, when did you first get introduced to talk to me, Chris? Talk to me. Help yeah. me out. Help me Listen, out. Um, my journey to technology, I'm about to date myself. I'm an 80s baby. I was born in 82. Um, my first I guess my first love um, kind of came when Apple, my mom is a retired school teacher in Baltimore City Public Schools. A lot of people know who my mother is. She worked at Dunbar High School, Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School in Baltimore, Maryland. And one summer I had to be six years old. She brought Jonathan the old school brown box Mac. And I literally fell in love in that moment, not knowing at six years old what love was, but I knew in that moment I was in love with that machine. I played on it every day. Um, I broke it, actually, and I had to kind of put it back together. Um, and my mother will never let that down. But I played <laughs> Oregon Trail on there. Um, you know, I did, you know, all sorts of things with typing exercises. That was kind of my first real introduction, hands on to technology. And I realized in that moment, this was a path to my destiny. But, you know, when you get older, you start thinking that other paths are your destiny and you run away from what is essentially a part of your calling. So, mm -hmm. you know, at six years old, that was where it was. And then over the years, I was, you know, putting stuff together technology wise. I was getting into Mavis Beacon, Beeman Tyken. Like, you know, I'm really dating mm -hmm. myself. Also. No judgment. I'm dating myself, you know, but 
the Oregon Trail game, I mean, I'm talking about the floppy disk one. That was just, you know, when you're playing all that all day and you're playing around with the computer and you're figuring that out. And my mother got other math and science games because I've always been fascinated with math and science as a child. So, you know, that was like my real first introduction to the world of technology and more so specifically in that instance, computing. Wow. May, that's so funny that you brought up Mavis Beacon. I was thinking about that game. I was thinking about that like, I don't know why it popped in my head. Now I see why. But it popped yeah. in my head like literally like three days ago. I was telling my brother, I, I texted him. I was like, you remember we used to play the game where you'd have to type the words and you have to hop on a lily pad and jump across? Yes. yes. People don't know. Those were instrumental to most of the technologists that are prevalent now, like most of them had those, or even Carmen San Diego, you know. Oh my goodness. Okay? I'm just telling you, John, that it's just so many instances when you can think about and really kind of attribute a piece of people's story. But yeah, Mavis Beacon, listen, I type really, really fast now. And that is a tribute <laughs> to her. Um, and I took a keyboard in class at high school, but I was already typing fast, but Mavis Beacon did it for me, you know. Wow, wow. Okay, so. So, so you said you you discovered that at, at a young age. Yeah, I was six. I will never forget that. What? But, but then, what? What was the reason why you said you ran from your calling? Because you said at, at, at six, you know, you were right there with it. But then, yeah. Um, to be quite honest, um, I don't really think at that time I knew how powerful I was as a person, mm. and I also don't think I knew how powerful my gifts were at that time. You know, growing up in, in the 90s and graduating high school in 2000, you know, I was a student athlete. You know, I was really well known at my high school and, you know, I played three sports. I played volleyball, basketball, softball, all seasons. Mm -hmm. And I was a football manager. I sang in the choir. You know, I was yearbook editor for two. Like I did a lot of stuff. Wow. So. When it came to that part in high school, in middle school, yeah, I went to a magnet middle school that was STEM. Like I went to a magnet middle school and studied all those stuff. And then, you know, I got really, really involved in sports. And I wondered during those high school years, like, is computers really my path or should I really follow sports? Because I really love sports. And that attributed to my late father. Um, he passed in 2012. Very well known coach in the Baltimore area. And he was my first introduction to sports. So I went to my first basketball game at two weeks old. He was a coach at a school called McDonough. Um, and McDonough is a private school in the Baltimore metropolitan area for people who know. And I couldn't understand then when I hear the story now that my mom was like, why does she need to go? She can't even pay any attention. And my dad was like, she just needs to hear and just be in the environment. Even if she can't really hear, like she just needs to be there. And I went to my first, first football game at six months because he was coaching. And so going to the high school years, I really thought sports was a part of my destiny. And until it was time for graduation, I was trying to figure out, you know, I had applied to multiple schools, got in quite a few. Um, most of them were HBCUs. And, you know, I, I did look at one PWI, I looked at Temple because I had a lot of friends in high school there at the time who were going there rather. And when I was making the decision to go to Hampton, I remember watching a few years ago, my graduation video and when it was asked so what are you going to do and i was like well i think i'm going to be a computer scientist and i watched that and to think about that now like so i knew then that was a part of my destiny but that is not how my life ended up um fast forward to my undergrad years at hampton i ended up starting in computer science i changed quickly to pharmacy then there was a crucial moment with Hampton School of Pharmacy at the time, if you were at Hampton in like the early 2000s, you know that they were going through accreditation issues with their School of Pharmacy. It was a two year determinant to determine if they were going to get accredited. Mm. I did not want to take that chance being a sophomore and saying, OK, so you're telling me I got to wait two years for y'all to decide and I will start this pharmacy program. If, and I didn't want to take that chance. And then I had fell out of love with pharmacy just because I just didn't like some of the BS that was attached to it. And then I went back and said, you know what, I'm just going to, you know, take some computer science classes, which I took a few and I liked it, but I didn't like it enough to major in computer science. So I said, I'm just going to go ahead, get a psychology degree. I had a great relationship with my dean at the time. I interned for him for intern for him rather for a few semesters, had a great relationship with his family. Um, Dr. Adolph Brown, if you know him at Hampton when he was there, 
he was the best person ever. I still think about him to this day and I'm, we're on social, we're friends on social and the impact he had on my life and just thinking about looking at how people learn and study was different. So, you know, life came. I decided to be a juvenile probation officer, which a lot of people don't know. Wow. And I dealt with the most volatile young men in Montgomery County, which is in like near PG County in DC. And then I transferred back to my hometown and ended up working at the Baltimore City Juvenile Justice Center. And while I was there, technology readers hit because I was fixing my staff's computers <laughs> at work because the IT department was taking too long. So uh. that is where the journey started again for me. And that had to be like about 2000 and I'm gonna say 2007 or eight, I'm gonna say. And I just got tired of waiting for IT. And I had a few of my colleagues was like, you should be in a, the computer department. Like not saying I'm, I wasn't good at my job. But they were like, no, you like really like this stuff. Because <laughs> you're like sitting up here looking at the way that the we're typing in reports and how the software is formatted. Or, you know, you're looking at ways that, yeah, like, you know, new technology is coming. Like I was just talking about all that stuff. So, you know, just continuing along in the journey. So like if you're staying with me, you know, six years old, fell in love high school, met sports, fell in love and was trying to debate, get to college, realizing that I have to make some changes. Now we're in adulthood. And in 20, um, in 2009, rather, I left my job with the state of Maryland because I was living back in Baltimore at the time. And it was too many political and bureaucratic stuff going on. And I was like, I'm never going to be able to be successful in their IT department or computer science department if I stay here. So I took a chance on myself. Um, for a few months, I decided to apply for Apple. And if you work for Apple or if you have or applied, that is like getting into Harvard or Yale. You have plenty of interviews. I think I had five. Wow. And from there, that is where we got back into technology. And this was in, 20, in 2009. And I finally got hired in 2010. And so it took, keyword, it took all the way from 1988, when I was six at that time, to 2010 for me to reignite the passion to my purpose. So I think it took just me growing as a person, me understanding my gifts, and then me embracing them. So it took a long time for me to get to even where I am now, but that's really a part of the journey. It was really about me knowing more about myself as a person and being okay of seeing Black women in STEM and you know things of that nature. Mm. Talk talk a little bit about that, because I just want to just he, he, hear a little bit more about, about black women in STEM, because you brought it up. And, and, ju and just to bring some context for everybody else out there who's listening, just so we really get an understanding of, of what you're saying and, and just how powerful of a force <laughs> you are, Chris. Talk to yeah. Well, first of all, I appreciate that, accom um, that compliment. Let's start there. And then secondly, STEM is science, technology, engineering and mathematics for people who are unfamiliar with the acronym. When you look at the percentage of black women who are scientists, who are technologists, who are engineers, who are mathematicians or statisticians, the percentage is probably on the low end, probably about between 2.5, I believe, to 6%. Don't quote me, but I know that the rates have been that previously. And as you look, as we have come into this new century, there is still a great need for black women in STEM. Now, growing up, I can say I was semi-fortunate, and I say semi for a reason. My older brother on my mother's side, he is a engineer by trade, so I did see that. I also had a female older cousin, Rhonda, who was an engineer by trade, so I was able to see some significance. And then at the same time, friends or friends who become family who were in the computer science world who were black and looked like me. Like I said, I say semi because I wasn't fully exposed to it. I, I became more exposed in my adult years, but I will say I am grateful that my mother and my father did expose me to math and science. Like going to that STEM school helped, going to camps helped, um, things of that nature. But I didn't really get into it until later years. But it's important because there is a huge opportunity for black women in STEM to even work in sports. And there is a huge opportunity because everybody thinks of STEM. Oh, you got to work at like the big tech companies. Well, no, they need black women in STEM in healthcare. They need black women in STEM in sports. 
They need black women in STEM in a variety of industries. But there is a huge opportunity in front of us right now to answer or heed the call. And I feel like there are a lot of great black women who I admire near and far who have been trailblazing in that path. But there is a huge opportunity for millennials and, you know, Gen X and those generations to let Gen Z know that there's opportunities for them as well. Mm. Talk a little bit about women, women in STEM and in sport. How, how does that connect? Because I, I want to get clear because you, yeah. you, you, you're messing me up right now. You're Listen, me up. Um, a lot of people don't think about that. They think if you work in sports, you just got to work in sales. Right. Well, no, like they do work with scientists. So there are data scientists now that are a little bit emerging. And when you think about data and the numbers from games, how do you think that some of these teams are winning or increasing their percentages with their gameplay during the year? They're using data science and data analytics. So there's going to need to be a data analyst, which is a STEM career for mm. sports teams. You like there's a woman by the name of Diana. I want to say it's Mew or Mew. Um, she is a data scientist. She's not um, a part. She's not a black person, but she is in a minority. But she's a data scientist for the Los Angeles Lakers. There was also um, an interview, I want to say it was by Bloomberg. There was a data scientist. I cannot think of her name right now for the life of me, but she is a data scientist for the 76ers um, in the NBA. And there are plenty of data scientists and data analysts that can be used, you know, in all sports. Then engineers, I mean, computer engineers, how are they going to make sure that their websites you know, are up and running? How are they going to make sure that the systems that they're using technology are working for the franchises or things of that nature? And then when you look at mathematics, that goes back to my statisticians and my data points. I mean, there's huge opportunities in STEM. You don't just have to be a sales associate. You don't. You don't just have to sell tickets. You don't just have to be an HR. You can use your STEM degree regardless if it was on the undergraduate level, even on the associates level, because I don't want people to just think that, oh, just because they got associates, they got that. Because when you look at some of the people that work on these teams and staffs, some of them do have bachelors, but some of them have bachelors in basic subjects like psychology, mm. basic business stuff. But even if you got associates, like shoot your shot, like try, but you can work in sports in a STEM related field. And I think as time goes by, it's going to probably get a lot more popular. It hasn't peaked yet, but I give the trajectory about five to seven years and it probably will. The black techie, the black techie, everyone, the black techie. <laughs> My goodness. Gonna, gonna come through here on the show, gonna do this like this, Chris? Yeah, I'm just saying, I mean, these are facts that people don't think about. Like we, I, I mean, I think you understand what people talk about, yeah, I'm trying to work for the Lakers or for football. Like I'm trying to work for the Ravens or college basketball. I'm trying to go work at Duke. Like, okay, what are you trying to do? Oh, I'm just going to be an operations assistant. That's great. But like you got your degree in mathematics or statistics. Why couldn't you be a sports analyst for the team? Why couldn't you be saying for Duke, for instance, why can you work with Mike Krzyzewski's coaching staff, because I'm a Duke fan. So why can't you work with Mike Krzyzewski's coaching staff to say, hey, here is the data that we've looked at or the data set we've looked at from athletes when they um, are leaving to take break versus when they come back and ready for a summer training program. Like, what do those data sets look like? Or even greater, how we can look at the data sets of how the college athletes have been affected by Black Lives Matter. How did that have an impact on them mentally? Um, you know, emotionally and also on their practicing when they're training for the offseason. How did that affect them? Like that's data. A statistician, a math mathematician, a data analyst, a data scientist, they can pull that stuff and can say, here, Coach Shefsey, this is for you right here. Same thing mm -hmm. with Nick Saban at Alabama. Now, when you look at these sports schools, there's a huge bunch of data on the undergraduate level, but don't knock the high school programs either. Wow. I know some of y'all know a coach <laughs> on a team or a coaching staff intern or somebody. Coaches now are looking at data even on a high school level because it allows their players to increase the trajectory of helping them with recruitment or just looking at their sports performance. So there's opportunities. And I think that we need to start really looking at 
not only what we're passionate about, but what we're knowledge and skilled at, because you can really use that at any intersection, especially in the sports world. But we're so conditioned. Oh, I can only become a sales associate um, and things of that nature. Like you could be a recruiter. You could be a video recruiter and break down the data from film for your mm-hmm. coaches. I mean, there's so many opportunities. We just got to stop having the crab in a barrel mentality. Wow. 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 Yeah, I, I really I really love that that you brought that to the forefront, because mm-hmm. I can even think back when I was playing that, you know, coaches would come back and show, you know, how we did made shots, mm-hmm. missed shots, uh, you know, shots in the paint, whatever. And, you know, that that's that's something that I wouldn't connect yep. with with somebody who is in the realm of STEM. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's just something that we connect with. Oh, that's the assistant coach's job or yep. this person's job or that person's job. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I think that we have been so conditioned um, in the coaching world. And I mean, I've even coached at my alma mater for a few years after I graduated from Hampton. I went back to Milford Mill Academy where I went to school in the Baltimore area. And my assistant coach when I was playing was the head coach at the time. I was more so like I was a coach. I worked with the small fours and the post players. But I also took a lot of stats when I think about it. When I go back and think about everything I did, I did a lot of stats related stuff. So every game I was focused on players play, going over stuff. So I did a lot even at that point. And I learned a lot of that from my dad, too, because he did all that even being a head coach. Because at that time, you know, there weren't a lot of coaches that really thought about the numbers and really crunching them. But there are so many more opportunities if we just open our minds and really think about all of the possibilities, um, definitely within the sports space and definitely also too within STEM. Man, you messed me up here today, Chris. You messing me up. <laughs> you really, really messing me up. I mean, I just went a total different way than I thought it was going to go, but I mean, this is one of those pleasant surprises. So I, I, yeah. I love it. I, I love it. Absolutely. But as, as, as we talk about like how things have just shifted in sports and mm-hmm. just, just what, what you alluded to earlier, now, now I want to get to how do, how do we go from the stats aspect or how do we go from, you know, the analytics aspect to mm-hmm. now what 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 you're what you've really been pushing. And I, I've mm-hmm. been I've been seeing you advocate and push and just talking about the, the, the future being text. Yeah, so please enlighten the people. Chris, the people don't know. Enlighten yeah. Them, please. yeah, they don't. They don't, Jonathan. And I think, honestly, it comes to this intersection of really understanding fan engagement. So for the last seven years, I've had the great opportunity and privilege to help co-lead um, an official Ravens, Baltimore Ravens fan club here in Atlanta. Um, it's called Ravens Nation South. We've been here for seven years and its main focus and goal is to take care of displaced fans that are fans of the Baltimore Ravens. But it allowed me to see then as time has gone on, how fan engagement is important. When you think about sports and when you think about various sports season, a lot of people are having group chats, sharing clips from Bleacher Report, House of Highlights. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, when you think about ESPN, about plays or players either getting into something, if it's off the field antics or on the field performance or on the court performance. And I think text message marketing is definitely the future for athletes. And I would also say franchises and teams, too, because it's all about the data. And I think when you approach it like that, it's really important. So I'll talk about the athlete side first. So with name, image, and likeness coming, which you know, the bill has still not passed yet within the NCAA. However, there are states that have passed it within their states. Some are going to be effective as of 2021. You know, Georgia has passed with some conditions that I'll be honest and say I'm not really too fond of them. Mm. But there are other states that have said they're going to pass and go forward through smaller states in 2021. Then you have some in 2022 and 2023. This is a huge opportunity, especially for these athletes, especially the high school ones and the collegiate ones. They're able to use text message marketing and go direct to their fans. They don't have to think about a third party taking a percentage of the profits that they're already getting percentages taken from. So, Mm -hmm. for example, when you think about the Georgia law, um, the governor here um, decided to say that the schools could take 70 percent. I think it was 70 or 75. I don't know the exact percentage, so don't quote me, but I know it's in that range. Mm -hmm. Basically, moving 25 to 30 for the athletes. That's all they get to take. So there has to be other ways for them to be able to monetize and 
I think it's important for them to really think about building their fan base early so that when they do decide to turn pro or other opportunities come, they have consumers and fans to directly go to. I think that the missed opportunity for a lot of high school and collegiate athletes, and I will also say the professional ones, especially the rookies, especially with this last NFL draft, a lot of them use a lot of third party platforms, which you already know on the back end, most of them are already taking a percentage of what is being earned. But why can't you keep 100% of that and just go direct to your fans through the power of a text message to connect mm. them to your e-commerce platform? So I'll give an example of Devontae Smith because I'm an Alabama fan. So Devontae got drafted by the Eagles. I was waiting to see what the first rounders were going to do like their teams. So in like 20 minutes, he had um, a post up basically saying that his merch and shirts were available. Tweet two. I had a problem with this for one specific reason. He basically didn't capture the data at the time of all those fans trying to purchase. Now, did they have opportunities when they went to the site? Yes. I went to the site. I looked at the site. There was an email opt-in. However, he has to realize as a Gen Zer, your fan base as a Gen Z community, they would rather you text them than everything. That is the best way to communicate with them. Because when you think about the networks that they're on, like a TikTok or like a Snapchat, they're looking for instant, quick kind of engagement. They are not really going to be on Twitter like that. Rarely going to be on Instagram unless it's just for them showing themselves. Now, they might be on YouTube, but other than that, they're on a shorter micro type of platforms. So why not go to them where most of them are going to be anyway, which is in their phones? So a huge opportunity was missed with Devontae and his team because they could have cut out the middleman because of the algorithms with Instagram and all the algorithms with social. You don't really know who really saw that post. You can see the number of likes, but when your team pulls your analytics, what is your conversion rate? Were you able to really have a true conver conversion rate and click-through rate, meaning that you saw them click set link? Did you get that data? You probably did it. Because even with being somebody that has a blue check on Instagram, that doesn't mean that you're guaranteed all of that data that they have because you don't own these platforms. You mm -hmm. are leasing your spot on these platforms. Now, when it comes to text message marketing, you own that. You're using a platform as a vehicle, but you own the car. So that means you own all of your fan base's data. You can know about where they live, what they've last purchased from you, how often they interact with you. You can know their social currency about where they are on social media and how to connect with them and any other pertinent information that you want to know. You won't know that by unless you have your team manually go through every single one of your followers and try to attempt to find that information. And trying to pull that data set will take them a while. But why not have an opportunity to get that information firsthand and to have all of that data and to continually grow your fan base and your data set? Because that, at the end of the day, that's really all it is. It's a vehicle for your engagement, but it's really about you owning your, your, your data. Like Ryan Leslie, the great CEO of Superphone, who's also a Grammy Award winning producer, he always says it best, leverage social media, don't rely on it. And I think too many of these athletes are relying on social media, but what happens if you get locked out and you're doing a promo? Ooh. What happens if you're selling merch and Instagram is down that day? How Ooh. are you going to go to your fan base? Like we got to think about other alternatives and I implore these teams of these athletes to look at stuff like that or have somebody on your team that's responsible for this. Oh my goodness. The black techie, the black techie, everybody. <laughs> Man, Chris. It's the, it's the oh. truth, Jonathan. It's, these oh. are the conversations we're not having. These are the conversations we're not having. We are so concerned more, and this is no shade and no offense to these amazing athletes that get drafted because they worked hard. This is not mm -hmm. taking the talent away from them. But now you're entering the sports business phase of your career, too. It was just about your gameplay before and what you did on the field. But now you're in the professional leagues now. And when you think about that, the same kind of conversation is going to be for the upcoming NBA draft in July. You're in sports business now. Like you are a sports brand. So how are you really going to navigate and cut out the middleman? Not only can you retain the majority of your profits, but you don't have to worry about posting ads and doing all this stuff. You can go direct to your fan base. These are the conversations we need to start having 
with these athletes and their team, but also with these sports franchises too, because like I said, on the athlete side, that's one thing. The franchise side is a whole nother issue. And my biggest pet peeve right now with the WNBA, which I love, I feel like they're not doing enough for fan base engagement. And I had done some research probably, I'll say probably a few weeks ago. And I remembered in 2006, when the WNBA was in the playoffs, they were using text message marketing. You could text based on the team that was planned to vote. Um, and I forgot what the vote was for, but basically who was going to either win the game or something like that. I can make sure that your um, fans who are listening, um, you know, has the resource to that. But they used it in 06. And when you look at everything now, and especially with what the WNBA did in 2020, especially with racial injustice, there's a spotlight on them. And it's the 25th year. It's the 25th anniversary of the WNBA. There should be a lot more ways for franchises and teams and even players, um, especially in, in women's sports, that can definitely use this for their fan base. They're already not making the salary of what the NBA players are making. And we understand it's some political you know, stuff. And it's also dealing with the bargaining agreement. We get all that, that stuff. But there's a huge opportunity for them as well. And it could truly allow the WNBA players and also women college athletes and women high school athletes because they're just as phenomenal as the men athletes. And to be honest, some of them are even better than some of the male athletes. And I said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and when you think about it like that, this could be a huge vehicle for them as well. So there's opportunities on the athlete side for them personally and their teams personally. And then there's opportunities on the franchise side for sports and of all genders and all sports, it's really about them having the conversation and really thinking outside the box. That's really what it's all about. Oh, wow. So that, that, that hurts my heart a little bit. And the reason I say it hurts my heart is because everything you said has happened. Mm -hmm. Instagram has been down one day. Yeah. Twitter yeah. has been down one yeah. way. And then, and then what do people do? They hop over to the other platform. Exactly. It's just like, it, it's, it's just, it's scary to even think of, but mm -hmm. but just to what you're saying, imagine if those platforms went down yeah. and, and you know you you send out a text to your to, to your community, to your tribe, and you say, Hey, I'm I'm about to just go live, or, or hey, I, I decided I want to open up a Zoom room. Yes. And then you send out the link and then everybody's just just hanging out with you. You just you just talking, your team on the back end gets the website stuff worked out, mm -hmm. and then you're you're good to go. But if you don't have that, if you don't have that data, you don't have that telephone number. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's the honest truth. And I, like I said, I implore athletes and their teams, regardless of their agenda and their sport to really think about the data and also really think about the technology and how it is so simplistic to really grow a community now with text message marketing, you know, email used to be, the hot thing and even though text message marketing has been around for a few years it's just easier for fans to actually get access to their favorite athletes it's easier yes we can go on instagram and scroll on like i said house of highlights and bleacher report but if i had and i'll just say if i had lamar jackson i'm using my quarterback with the ravens if he sent out a text message to say hey by the way new merch is loading he wouldn't even have to go to social media. He would already alone, alone have the community to directly sell out all of his merch if he just text his audience. He wouldn't even need to go to social. I would say the same with, you know, players um, at Alabama, like Najee Harris, who's a rookie now with, with the team in Pittsburgh, because I'm not a fan of them because I'm in the AFC North. <laughs> but, you know, Najee could have did that if NIL was, was, was evident back then and went just direct to their fans. And... You know, when you think about all the algorithm with social media, when you think about how impersonal it is, it, it makes it feel like you're one of many versus where somebody and your favorite athlete is texting you. You feel like it's a one to one conversation. So would you rather invest directly to your fans and make them feel like they are the only one one to one? Or would you want to make them feel like they are one of many and just have no real engagement with them and things of that nature? Man, man. 
Oh wow, Chris, Chris <laughs> you, 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 you messed me up. You messed me up, and I, I, I want to respect you. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to bring you back. I'm, I'm gonna bring you back. We might, listen, we might have to do a part two of this, Jonathan, because I think um, the more I start really going into data stuff now, um, I have a huge lot of things in the pipeline, and you know, I'm even um, matriculating my studies, and I could share this with you. I've shared this with certain people in my family, but some of them have not responded to my text message, so they ain't seen it. So I can say that um, <laughs> my next my next step in education is really to start focusing on, um, you know, data science and data analytics and also an element of data journalism. I really feel like we can really use the power of data to tell these athlete stories properly um, and what they do off the field or court, as well as talk about their performance and them as a brand on the court, but still adding the fan engagement element with text message marketing. But um, I will be attending um, Ole Miss's inaugural MS in Sports Analytics. Um, it's the first sports analytics master's program um, and Ole Miss is doing it. It's a one year program and I'm in their inaugural cohort and I start this fall. So like I'm really seriously taking my sports analytics and my sports data science seriously because there's a huge void and opportunity because when people are looking at a lot of data and analytics in the sports space, there are not people that look like us once again. So I feel yeah. like I am in the process of being a trailblazer again, because I told my mother the other day, I was like, well, I found a master's. I said, now I'm going to have to go to a university and create a PhD. So I have been calling for the last few weeks and emailing here locally, um, Georgia Tech, because I'm like, hey, I'm mm. first of all, I'm an alum, but y'all are a research school. I know for a fact wow. if I create this PhD program, like I know for a fact it would be huge, especially with the sports in this ecosystem. So mm. I'm thinking about that. But the big win for me is that I'm looking to do this and take this back to the H HBCUs. Mm. I want to give the students at HBCUs, especially the black ones who realize you don't just have to be playing high school or playing sports all your life and then realize your sports life is over. You can transcend your sports journey and just into another capacity. You can use your love for math and science. So I'm, I'm definitely in talks with the HBCU now, even teaching text message marketing as a course in the school of business, because I was like, that's a skill that they need. Game and change. nobody nobody is teaching it. And then also, too, I really want to take my sports analytics and sports data science knowledge back to the HBCUs as well. Um, there is an amazing woman that I am looking to connect with. Her name is Dr. Felicia Stukes. She um, is at the University of North Carolina, I think Charlotte. And she teaches at Johnson C. Smith, I still believe, but she has a sports analytics club. She is the model. That is what more of us do. If people talk about, because I'm the product of HBCU, happily, love Hampton, love talking about Hampton. And my mother, my both my parents, product of HBCUs. My mother has three degrees from Morgan State University. Three. <laughs> she has a master. She has two masters. Excuse me, because she would be remiss if I correct. She has two masters in education, and she also has her bachelor's. And my father was a basketball standout at Virginia Union. So I'm big on HBCU. So yes, I am personally making it my mission to reach out to my alum at Hampton, saying, "Hey." Here's what I'm working on when I get closer to my PhD being done. Um, I want to start teaching some stuff virtually because I'm not trying to move back to VA. Um, same with, with Morgan and Virginia Union. But I'm here in one of the greatest meccas of education here in Atlanta in the AUC. You got Morris Brown. You got Spellman, Morehouse, Spellhouse for those Spell, Spellman, Morehouse people. And you have Clark Atlanta. There are opportunities here, too, with a sports epic center of athletes. Now, I'm not going to say that the sports teams here in Atlanta are great because I ain't their fan. So, you know, you got the Braves, you have the Falcons, you have Atlanta United. All of that is data. They're all going to need data people or those are research projects. Then you have the other league teams. Then you have the college teams. There are opportunities for HBCU students. And I wish in, in culmination of my journey that I would have trusted my instinct and knew who I was more to say it was okay for me to do this path. But I am more comfortable in who I am as a woman and as a person. And I love sports, but I also love math and science and technology too. So why can't I marry them together and create something for myself to leave a legacy, not only for myself and my family, but what about the generation behind me? 
So I'm really huge and big on going to get the education because yes, I'm looking to help my clients, but I'm also thinking about the generations behind me and to show them that, hey, you don't just have to be an athlete, not saying if your talent isn't there that you cannot matriculate to the next level because I will not take that away from anybody. But what if you're that D1 football player and maybe you didn't get drafted and you got to fall back on your degree and maybe you want to figure out, hey, maybe I want to work with a local team and I can still train to here if my agent gets a call. What if you're that basketball player, female basketball player, and you didn't get any WNBA tryouts and you want to go overseas, but you can still work on your degree at the same time and start focusing on stuff and creating content. That is a huge part of my purpose and my mission. I want to make sure that I can empower these young people, these black young people, that you can do so many things in sports It's them. And I am going to use myself as the catalyst to make sure that I can go pay it for it. And that is what I'm planning to do. Yes. Like I said, I will be working with my, my clients. <clears throat> who knows? Professional teams. Who knows? Rich Paul and Clutch Sports might call. I don't know. It could happen. But I'm also thinking about the people behind me because I'm going to need a, a bigger team. Why not mm. go higher from the pool that I'm educating? Wow. And they're right there. I want to give real students real opportunities. So that's a huge part of my mission. I know we probably might need a part two, but I think in totality, you know, I'm really looking to leverage my education and I'm really looking to make a transformative impact in the sports state of the world. And I hope people are ready for me because I'm not going quietly. And I will make sure that everything I say I'm going to do that I do and make sure that most importantly, I inspire not only the student athletes, but also these black students at these HBCUs. Because when you look at PWIs, even though I went to one for my master's and going to one for my second one, there's still a void that we're behind in education at HBCUs. And I need us to start as products to figure out ways we can either go back to our alma maters or HBCUs where we're at locally to see how we can help them make a greater impact. That's how you pay it forward. The black techie, everyone, the black techie. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Chris, please, please let, let everybody know where, where they can find you, how they can follow you, connect with you. Cause yeah, you're, you're definitely coming back, but just let, let people know, please. If yeah. You yeah. Most definitely. Um, I am at the black techie literally on all social media. That is the word, the black and techie T E C H I E. You can find me on, I'm mainly really on, um, I'm on Instagram, but I love to have conversations like of thought leadership and stuff in the sports data world on Twitter. You can definitely find me very active there. Mm -hmm. And I also am getting reactive on LinkedIn as well. Um, I have a few um, blog pieces on Medium. So once again, if you look for the Black Techie, I'm there. You can go to my website, theblacktechie.com. I'm going to be honest. It is real basic right now because it is in the process of being redone. But you can find me at the Black Techie everywhere on YouTube as well. Um, I'm looking to pretty much restart. Um, I'm rebranding my YouTube. So definitely in Q3, there will be a lot more stuff I'll be sharing. But yeah, the Black Techie everywhere, that is where you can follow me online. Excellent. 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 <clears throat> Chris, I I, I mean, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you coming <laughs> on. But I mean, I also just appreciate just like I told you before, you're you're mm -hmm. a you're a phenomenal facilitator. And then even that still holds true, even to what you just shared towards the end, because you're facilitating the impact. And you're not like, mm -hmm. I want all the credit. I want to do this. But you're like, I'm trying. I'm trailblazing mm -hmm. so that those who come behind me, the path will be uh, easier or at least simplified. So, yes. Chris, thank you. No, thank you for the opportunity. And I'll leave with this last thought. Um, I always said I would never be a teacher. Um, my mother and my father both were teachers, even though my dad coached too. And it wasn't until I talked to a good friend, Dr. Key Hallman, who is the CEO and founder of the Village Market here in ATL. And she's big in the education world here. And she was like, you've been teaching for years. I was like, yeah, I just, yeah, that's not my ministry. But now I realize um, in facilitation, it is a part of it. So that impact and that imprint is what I'm trying to take to this next generation. So thank you for allowing me to, you know, have a moment and space on your platform to share and speak on that. I would love to come back for a second one because I know there's so many more things we could have dove into today. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak and use my voice on your platform. 
most most definitely most definitely well glad glad that glad to have you and then as, as soon as we get off we're gonna reschedule another time for you yes. to do the part two so, so th th thank you so much chris I, I appreciate you so much thank you to all the ballers out there i know you all just heard this amazing episode that's why i got excited before we even started because i knew I, I just knew something great was about to happen and as you all can see as you all heard something great just took place so i want you all to make sure that you follow and connect with chris on all platforms the black techie the black techie follow her subscribe to her youtube channel and then let let her know like what really what really hit you in this episode or even if you're like oh wait a minute i need to get connected i need to get a text platform set up you want to get connected one-to-one -one with your audience with your fan engagement chris is the go-to connect point blank period so to all the ballers out there i appreciate you all tuning in and rocking for another episode and until next time i'm jonathan jones and this is beyond the ball where we help you succeed beyond your degree